You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, which is part one. It is episode number 201. I decided to make this a two-part podcast with uh, the same guest, Zulika Williams, who I found on TikTok a while back. And Zulika is the mom of a four-year-old boy. The reason we split it is because it really has two chunks. The first episode, uh, the first chunk, and it's going to be episode 201, is all about Zulika, her fall into the autism world, um, my finding her on TikTok, and some of the struggles that her son has with language. And then next week, we are going to have part two, which is going to be episode 202 with Zulika Williams talking about um, her son Maddox's um, severe self-injurious behavior and aggression and all the problem behaviors she has, and also her services and how um, it's hard to coordinate. It's hard for her as a parent to juggle all the things he needs when he's having problem behaviors and trying to figure out what he needs most. So let's get to part one with Zulika Williams, episode 201. Zulika, I am so thrilled to meet you today and have you on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a dream to be on one of your podcasts. <laughs> well, that's great. I know you You told me just now that you listened to a bunch of podcasts in the past. So um, gra- glad to have an avid listener here to share your story and to, you know, we're going to talk about Zalika's story and then we're going to move into um, self-injurious behaviors, tantrums, meltdowns, and kind of do a mini hot seat um, towards the middle and end of this. So, um, but first, why don't you tell listeners about your fall into the autism world? So I have a four-year-old, he is autistic, non-speaking and we saw signs of autism when he was honestly a, a baby. There's things he didn't do. He didn't smile. He didn't walk. He didn't, um, he didn't crawl until after he learned to walk and he learned to walk at 17 months old. So at such a later time, and then at two years old, he was diagnosed with sensory processing disorder, which even then we felt like, no, we feel like he has autism, but this was during COVID. So he was diagnosed through zoom, which through zoom, you can't see everything as we all know. Um, and then he wasn't diagnosed with autism until he turned three years old. And that's actually when I found you as well too online while researching, how can I help my son? Because I have a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, but at the same time, I don't have a specific scope or, you know, zoomed and dialed into autism. So this was new to me. I knew about it and, but I didn't ever work with, you know, a bunch of people who were autistic. So I found you, you know, through searching, I took your online course, learned a bunch. I love table time, (laughs) Mr. Potato Head. So I started doing stuff like that with him, you know, at least two or three times a day, which we saw improvements just from that. So we fell into the autism world by our son. You know, he's now four years old. He does have self injurious behaviors. He, with his head, you know, like this, and he'll bang it on the walls, the floor, which is hard to see as a parent. And at the same time, he is an AAC learner. So he's learning to talk through using an iPad. Um, and then he also has his younger brother, who's 20 month old, who's a 20 month old, who is a great model for him, to be honest. So that's how we came into the autism world. Right, right. Well, that sounds great. And we did do, um, I did an interview with Dr. Catherine Lord, one of the really internationally known researchers in the field of autism. And she is big on um, diagnoses. And so we did an interview about problems with diagnosing during COVID and uh, the waiting list got a lot worse. So we can link Catherine Lord's um, podcast interview in your show notes. And I mean, we had so many parents join us during COVID uh, because their evaluations were were canceled. They were doing Zoom evaluations. Kids were home from daycare and preschool. Um, one of our one of our really best uh, interviews was was with Michelle C, who joined during COVID. We can link her her 
um, two podcasts in the show notes. Um, so yeah, and that whole sensory processing uh, disorder diagnosis, and you know, it's it's like it the, these techniques work no matter if it's sensory processing, if it's a speech delay, if it's early signs of ADHD, early signs of autism. But when you see a two year old who is having signs of ADHD, sensory processing issues, excessive tantrums, you know, and then probably not pointing and things like that. It's, it really doesn't do any child any good to just slap these different diagnoses on them without autism because, um, and, and I know you're out in California. I mean, did, did anybody suggest like the regional centers out there? For- yeah, so he is with IRC. That was not suggested in the beginning. However, I did know of IRC. I think I learned about IRC when he was almost three years old. So that's when I started the process to get him fully into IRC. And um, IRC is... I'm sorry, Inland Regional Center. So in California, we have regional centers. And with regional centers from zero to three years old, you can do early intervention. But by the time he was fully enrolled, it was after he turned three. So that early intervention aspect came out and he wasn't able to do that. So, but he is with Inland Regional Center right now, which helps a lot. Like we're considering moving because we have lack of services right now where we live. We live in the mountains and for us, for him to just get speech and occupational therapy, feeding therapy, we have to drive over an hour away. Uh, and that's driving down a windy mountain road. So he throws up. He doesn't do good with that as well either. So we have to move for our son. So that way we can get into a bigger city and get him the services that he needs. Wow. Yeah, that's really tough. And then for Lucas, he was diagnosed with autism one day before he turned three. And that transition from birth to three services yeah. which is part C on, you know, the federal law and, and then going to three to five, which is part B, it's a huge issue. Um, even if you get the diagnosis a month or two before three, um, the transition is, is really, really tough. And that's why I just am spending my whole life uh, really trying to get to the parents because there's so much you can do. I mean, I found you on TikTok, which you're my third guest that I found on TikTok that I didn't know about um, in the past couple of months. And so you're on TikTok and I saw you posting about the shoebox program and, and those sorts of things. So we reached out, we were like, Hmm, she looks like she may have taken the course. And of course you did. And you were very positive about the course and the book and, um, And so, you know, we found you there, but we can link the other two podcast guests that I had from TikTok, Mandy and uh, Mandy Grass and Doc, Sarah, Nicole, they're both behavior analysts. And I know as a mental health counselor, Zalika, you, you have a pretty good mix of, of professionals and parents on your TikTok. Yes. So I love I didn't even know much about TikTok until last year. So I just joined it this year in January. And it's so nice to be in a community where there's all of these parents going through similar things and we could bounce resources off of one another. There's special education teachers I'm friends with, principals, psychologists, Doc Sarah and Nicole as well too. I love her. <laughs> we duet each other a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, it's nice. That's how I found out about her because... Mandy Grass, who's a behavior analyst, had some kind of duet or tagging, you know, situation going with Dr. Sarah Nicole. And it's amazing. It's like, um, it's, it's such a, I I had a lot of hesitancy about joining TikTok and I only got on the platform uh, in May, in late May, but, um, you know, just meeting people like you and, and it, it really is a pretty positive environment. For people like me who live in a mountain community or say even if I lived in the city and I don't, I go to these parks or I go to these community events and I don't see other parents with kids who are autistic. So it's a big difference, like the way in which they view me and the way in which we talk to each other, get invited to maybe play groups. And then all of a sudden I'm not invited invited anymore because my son is autistic and they don't say anything to me. They just completely cancel me out. So then to come on TikTok, it's this community to where I feel welcome. I can talk about what happened 
earlier in the day and everyone understands as opposed to being, you know, going to the grocery store and no one understands. So TikTok is a great platform for that. Yeah. Just to show the love and support. <laughs> yeah. So your son is getting ABA services now? Is yes. That- yes. So he started ABA services in January of this year, actually 2022 took about six months to get him into ABA because of where we live and the waiting list. But yeah, once he started ABA, we immediately started PEX and maybe like a month later and he was doing so great with PEX. And then from there we moved on to an AAC maybe a month and a half later. And yeah, ABA is helping tremendously. (laughs) Tremendous. Does he go to a clinic or do people come into your home? Yeah, where we live, we do not have a clinic for ABA whatsoever. So they come to our home right now. That's nice. Yeah. So I did do a video blog, pretty lengthy one on the the differences and the pros and cons of home versus school ABA and clinic ABA. And, um, and there are people listening from literally all over the world. And so there's people here listening who don't have any ABA in their whole country or live like you do out in a rural area. And even Kelsey, our community manager, who's been on the podcast multiple, multiple times now, she was driving, she was in Canada and she was driving for ABA services over an hour each way. And and they unfortunately were doing the wrong thing and her child was getting worse. So just because you have ABA, or you have it, you know, in a clinic or in a school and, and something isn't working and they're working on the wrong things. Doesn't mean that ABA is all bad or, you know, um, it's, it's just, it puts you in a difficult situation. I'm sure with being out in the rural area, trying to, you know, that that's a complication too. Right. I agree. Cause at Right now where we're at with ABA, I love that it's at home and I love that I'm able to be in the sessions and help out. But at the same time, I think I'm at a point where I would rather have them in clinic, you know, actually go in away from home just because at times I feel like he's a little too attached to me. And then with our little, my, with his little brother as well too, he's in the sessions and now he's, he's at the point where he wants to do everything his big brother is doing, which makes it difficult for the focus to be on Maddox. Maddox is our four-year-old autistic son. So it takes the focus away from him a lot because little brother, you know, I want to do it or signing more of me. (laughs) Um, So it's difficult. So I would personally rather have him go away from me now and do ABA outside of the home, which is another reason why we're looking to move. So that way we have more, a variety of services and we can do that. Mm -hmm. And in my first book, The Verbal Behavior Approach, which was published in 2007, um, very long time ago, it just came out in uh, its 17th language, with that being Spanish, finally. Um, so both my books are now in Spanish. But in that first book, I talk about not, quote unquote, moving for services. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in that, you know, like if everybody just went like, okay, where's good services? And you see this all the time. I mean, I but I want to make a disclaimer that I do think that you should move. <laughs> but in my book, I talk about how, you know, don't just pick up and move to, you know, XYZ County in New Jersey because you heard that they give ABA or they have a good ABA clinic. Because what happens is that ABA clinic may be full, maybe for kids at different functioning levels, maybe kids at different ages, the school board may change. They, you know, you could move to right next door to me with a very similar child and get not the services that I would be getting for my son. So it's, it's really a crapshoot. However, with that being said, if you live somewhere that's really inaccessible to services, or you live somewhere that, or you have to move anywhere for somebody's job or, you know, some other factors, then you better believe I would recommend looking into where would the best place to move would be. And that would revolve around a lot. But anyway, let's move on Mm -hmm. because we have done, I think I've done five or six hot seats so far. So I'm not really sure if we're going to count this as a traditional hot seat because the other four or five or six, I think the first one wasn't really uh, a real hot seat either. In fact, 
the middle ones were all like people sent me their assessments and their plans and really walked like I was able to review documents and that sort of thing and then fully give uh, my thoughts on it. Now, this isn't really advice either way, whether you send me forms or not. I still only know a small fraction of your son and your family situation. So it's no not <laughs> all for informational purposes only. Nothing here I'm going to advise on is actually advice, not medical or behavioral advice. And when you are talking about self-injurious behavior, it's even more um, critical that people know that this is this is just a discussion. Um, we're moving into like the hot seat portion of this. And we can link the other hot seats in the show notes to give you an idea of like how in depth they can be. And they were all kind of on different things, but I think it'll be good to just talk about um, Zulika's son is like she said, non-speaking and he has self-injurious behavior and meltdowns or tantrums. So can you, um, so the first thing I would do is, is we need to assess, we don't need to jump right into assessing the self-injurious behavior and the tantrums because I have a lot more questions. Um, my first question is, have you done um, the assessment, the Turn Autism Around assessment, which is in the book as a one-page assessment, it's in the courses, but it's also just, um, in October, just released as a digital assessment. Um, you know, you probably didn't uh, get looped into the digital assessment at this point, Zulika, but it's basically the one page assessment. So I did do the one page assessment. <laughs> you did the one page assessment. Have you done it recently? I have not done it recently. So I haven't done the one page assessment since I took your course last year. Right. So that is the first step. Because my questions um, about other things, like, for instance, let's just look at the one page assessment. Now, people listening can go right now to marybarbera.com forward slash free assessment, because for the first 1000 people, you can take a 10 minute assessment online and you can get your whole one page printout individualized for your child. And it will definitely be free for the first thousand. And then we're, you know, I've invested a lot of time and money into this digital assessment. It quantifies everything, gives scores. So after the this interview, Zulika, you'd want to start there. But the one page assessment is in my book, 40, page 49. So let's just quickly go down, <clears throat> excuse me, Let's just first quickly go down and um, he got a diagnosis. He's four years. How many months now? When, when's his, he was born in May. So he's four years, three, four months at this time. Okay. So that's kind of important that it's not like a brand new three or, uh, or a brand new four or a four turning five, you know what I mean? Like, so um, when when people say, oh, my child's four, I kind of want to know, okay, so he's four and a quarter or something like that. Okay. I um, uh, got the diagnosis at three after his sensory process. And we're just going down the left-hand column. He is currently receiving services. Um, is he on any medication? He's not on any medication. Okay. And allergies, uh, is he on a special diet? Um, he is lactose intolerant. Okay. And of, he's a very picky eater. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, yeah, we'll get to picky eating soon. Um, and uh, any allergies? No allergies. Okay. Safety awareness concerns. Does yeah, he does elope? He wanders. Um, traffic. He'll walk into traffic. He'll go right into water. He does not pay attention to these things. Yeah. He, so that's, so that's a a big you know, area of need is safety. And that's very common, especially for younger kids on the spectrum. Um, okay. So eating and drinking, you said he's picky. So, um, is he like, what does he eat? Like, what will he, what won't he? Eat? Okay. So of course his favorite food is pizza. So he'll eat pizza. Um, he will eat oatmeal. He will eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Typically, the only thing he will drink is water or Pediasure. Um, that's, and chips, of course. He's not a big candy eater. 
Um, that's about it. He's extremely picky. I used to be able to get a lot of smoothies in him and he's back and forth about the smoothies. Now he'll, sometimes he'll drink them. Sometimes he won't. Yeah. So in the, um, in the book, there's a whole, uh, chapter on picky eating and that is chapter 10. Also, Zulika did recently come back to our membership program. So there is a bonus video on feeding, um, with actual videos of me helping kids learn to eat and be less picky. Um, and then also in the book and in the um, course, we talk about this uh, easy, medium, difficult uh, foods list. So um, we can link a podcast episode about that as well. So um, does he use utensils? He is learning to use utensils. He does not have it down all the way yet. Every now and then he will use a fork, but he still wants a lot of assistance. Yeah. So, and I don't push utensils, especially for picky eaters that have a lot of other skills to work on, but I would, uh, the scooping with a spoon is an 18 month skill. So for both right. boys, I would, I would push that more than I would push, um, forks or okay. Certainly not knives. And to be honest, he's only been interested in using utensils lately because his brother, oh, his okay. brother uses them. That's so cool. he's been him doing it. So he's trying to. And even with Maddox too, he just learned how to take an actual bite out of food. Mm. Maybe like a week, two weeks ago, I think. Oh, like, yeah. actually, like if you had a banana, take a bite and pull away. He was never able to do that until recently. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and he's swallowing okay. You can give him things to chew on. He knows on. how to swallow. He will hold pocket things in his mouth at times, a lot of times, but he does know how to swallow. Yes. And you might want to get a, a feeding evaluation. Um, there are feeding yeah. experts. You yeah. have one? Okay. Yeah, we have that, but it's on hold right now because of insurance issues and us living up here and Maddox not being able to go off the mountain, like I said, without throwing up. Yeah. Yeah. And how about um, bottles, pacifiers, any of that? He stopped pacifiers at 18 months. He stopped bottles prior to that. So okay. how about that. Um, what kind of cups does he drink? Does he drink out of a straw and an open cup? No. Yes, he drinks out of a um, 360 cup. He knows how to drink out of a straw. Um, he can at times drink out of an open cup, but that's difficult for him still. He will just kind of pour it on himself or pour it out. Yeah. So, yeah. And what about sleeping problems? He has sleeping problems, a lot of sleeping problems. I would say from 18 months old till maybe about two and a half or um, no, yeah, to almost three years old. And to be honest, once he started ABA, those sleeping problems stopped. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just, I feel like it's him being in, cause he does it for five hours a day. So he's really gaining a lot of new skills through ABA, you know, maybe um, putting his brain to work in different capacities and different ways. That's helping him to sleep more, I think. And just being more interactive, gaining new skills. It's helping him a lot as opposed to just, you know, he used to just drop rocks. He would pick up rocks and drop them. Pick up rocks and drop them to where he wasn't really being worked with his brain. Yeah. How about um, potty training? Have you tried any of that? Yes, we've been potty training um, maybe five months now. I don't remember exactly. Um, he has been able to successfully go once in the twice in the toilet now eliminate in the toilet but since then he got covid and then potty training went out the window i'm going to be honest mm -hmm. he had covid a couple weeks ago so he we stopped potty training and as of till last week we started potty training again and we're not just um fully going into it we're just going in the bathroom and like you had a video on tiktok saying you know just take them in the bathroom and change their diapers in the bathroom mm -hmm. so that's where we're starting <laughs> with that as opposed to sit on the toilet he's not ready for that yet so we're going yeah. very well. sometimes you have to repair the bathroom repair the toilet yeah. um you know get an insert for the toilet at this point versus a, a little potty because i think um yeah he's too big for the little potty. Yeah, he's too big for that plus you know you might as well get something that um is going to be good for the long haul and you know i 
up until actually pretty recently, I was um, recommending a little potty, probably a little too much because then there is a transition to the regular toilet with a, with a insert. And so I saw something somewhere and I was like, you know what, I think I've been a little bit too um, recommending the small potty. I mean, for really tiny kids, yeah. you know, he's, 20 he's months old or whatever, <laughs> you know, like sit them on a couple times, you know, a day is fine. But as kids get older, it's just too, too big. His younger brother is potty trained at 20 months. Oh, so wow. I think it is helping him to see him do it. Oh, good. <laughs> So that, and then I, we also, so his younger brother uses a urinal and I'm thinking maybe we can try Maddox with the urinal as well. And we've tried it a couple times and he still doesn't quite understand, but he, I noticed he is watching. So, well, I mean, one caution and I am, I have been called the potty queen because I'm a registered nurse and a behavior analyst. And so, and potty training is one of my specialties. I have a whole chapter in my book and two bonus videos in the course that you can watch. But for kids like Maddox, sitting on the, on the toilet is key for, for urination. Um, okay. kids, boys should sit until they're fully bowel trained. Okay. In my long career of two decades plus, um, I have seen so many older boys who um, are pee trained, but not poop trained and refuse right. to sit on the potty. So I would not recommend personally going to a urinal. Okay. I mean, unless it was going to be he used the urinal and then he sat. But a lot of times those first bowel movements are actually... Um, by accident as you're sitting to pee. Okay. And so in sitting to pee and relaxing everything is key to pooping on the potty. Okay. So the other thing is um, if he's constipated at all. And most people say, no, my child's not constipated. <laughs> but if, if but 90% of the people that go to um, I'm blanking on his name. Um, the doctor that I had on the show on the podcast, he's from Wake Forest. I'm blanking on his name. Anyway, we're going to link his, his, in the podcast, his podcast episode, because he basically 90% of the people that come to his clinic say their kids aren't constipated and they do an x-ray and 90% of, of kids are constipated, even when their parents say no. So how um, would a parent know that without the x-ray? When it seems like with Maddox, he's going every day to every other day. Okay. His <laughs> Dr. Stephen Hodges, his advice, he's a pediatric urologist, which urologist is P, yet his whole practice focuses on constipation. And that's the whole episode he did with me, uh, which is a really great episode. And I first found him and uh, credited his work in the book, It's No Accident. Okay. Um, but- more recently, he published uh, the MOP book and the pre-MOP book. So his advice is you need to keep keep a, a close eye, um, like documentation, if your husband's watching him or the ABA therapist or whatever, whoever changes his diaper because he's not potty trained yet. It's not, it. kids should be going and adults every day, um, one to two times a day. If they're going every other day, it might not be a huge issue, but it probably is telling us that he's constipated. The other thing is you really have to look at the consistency of the poop. Like I remember way back before I had this information, I'd have clients that we were potty training and they would literally send me these little potties full of like adult size, big form stools. That's actually bad. That actually means that they are holding their poop and they are constipated. Mm. Even if it doesn't look like little hard balls, it looks like big poop. Okay. Um, if it only comes out every couple of days and it's either hard balls or large, extra large poops, that's a sign that they're constipated. Constipated. Okay. So anyway, we need to figure constipation out before you get too far into potty training, but relaxing, having boys sit on the potty is, is a big, um, what I would recommend versus urine. Okay. 
So I've been pairing his potty with prior to him getting COVID with the tablet. Cause that was so hard to get him to yeah, actually yeah, yeah. Just sit. So when he did finally go one day, he was watching Mickey Mouse and it even shocked him. He looked at me like, <laughs> so yeah, I have to pair it no matter what with Maddox. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then grooming and dressing, like washing hands, brushing teeth. Will he do those things? Will he'll he brush his teeth, but not really. He'll start to brush them. And then, cause he'll look at his little brother and his brother's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and then Maddox will just start ma- chewing on the toothbrush. Yeah. Cause he has jewelry and all that, or he'll put his hands in his mouth. So he'll go back to doing that behavior with the toothbrush. And, and then with dressing himself, he does not know how to dress himself. We work on it every day. We practice and washing his hands. He does get excited to wash his hands and, but he won't really go through all the movements. He wants to do it really fast and be done. Okay. And what about, will he let you help him brush his teeth? He will let me help him. Yes. For, let me correct that for maybe about 10 seconds (laughs) and then he's done. (laughs) Yeah. So it's important that kids not be crying or refusing prompts to help them complete tasks like grooming and dressing, because that actually also leads, you know, is, is problem behaviors. And so we need to focus on that. Um, okay. I also did a, um, video blog on, um, how to desensitize kids to, uh, anything aversive, even like sitting on the potty, how to repair things. It's in chapter 13 of my book. I have a bonus video within my course too on desensitization um, that you may want to watch. Okay. So you said he's non-speaking, so we don't have to really go over every little bit, but when, when I hear non-speaking, I want to know, does he make sounds or have any word approximations or any pop out words? No pop out words. He does make sounds like with Maddox. It's a lot of abba, 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 and digga, 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 digga. Um, a lot of different sounds. And he's been making a lot more different sounds in the last couple months we've noticed. And uh, so last night something happened while I was in the kitchen making dinner. His dad swears he said up. Okay. I was telling Maddox, okay, Maddox, stand up, up, up. And he says, Maddox said, up, up. I wasn't there. I didn't hear it. So I don't know. (laughs) So that's where we're at currently. Okay. So my one piece of advice would be that, you know, he is making sounds and that's great that you're getting farther with AAC um, and those sorts of things. But I would, I would also really push vocal, vocal language, pairing vocals, using the one word times three strategy up up, up, before you pick him up, before you go up the steps, as you're going up the steps, um, use those single words up to three times when you're going to open a door, stand down, get to his level, open, 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 you know, um, especially as he's young, um, it's, it's never too late, like, you know, four-year-old, but he only started real therapy at after three, you only got a diagnosis after three. So it's really not, I, I don't find it useful to kind of put him in the, he's going to be severe for the rest of his life category. Um, I have seen lots of other kids that looked particularly bad at three and four. Mm -hmm. Um, and that started to flourish later. He also wanted to, wanted to say, and, and I want your thoughts on that, but just so I don't forget, you were saying he, he chews on the toothbrush and he chews on jewelry and those sorts of things. I have found that excessive chewing can oftentimes be a, a, um, a medical issue. Okay. And I've done a couple of video blogs, one on chewing and one on, um, mouthing and we can link both of those. But like, if you're, if you're listening and you're out running, you're like, I want to know, you know, the show notes will be at marybarbera.com forward slash two zero one, which is going to be Zulika's um, show notes, but you can always Google Mary Barbera or Mary autism plus the topic. So chewing on clothing or mouthing, uh, 
mulch at the playground or which is even more dangerous, you know, like, Mm -hmm. but as you can see, you know, I do want to get your reaction. I should have got it before I jump back. Can I ask a question really quick? What, what were you saying that that was linked to like, um, lacking a vitamin or nutrients or, okay. okay. Yes. Or, or it could be like, have you checked his lead levels and those kinds of things like, it could very well be a medical issue. And I know Luke has had a ton of chewing and looking back, there were things that I wish I would have done like back in, I mean, this is the late nineties, early two thousands. Like we, they didn't have like, you know, good chewy that were non-toxic and like, like the OT gave him some rubber to chew on, which was probably filled with chemicals. You know what I mean? Like, it just, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. I mean, it was way back, but. So what would you have done? Would you have given him truly um, to be fully accessible to him all the time or? In my, in my video blogs now, now that I have seen many, many kids chewing, I have um, advice that I don't, I don't just keep giving chew, chewies um, usually. Okay. You know, again, I'm not, I don't know your son. I don't know anything about him. And, but I would investigate. Okay. Zinc, magnesium, you know, zinc to copper ratio, like all these things that, um, I've looked at through the years with, with multiple kids, not just my son. When he doesn't have his jewelry, he will put his whole entire mouth or hand into his mouth and chew on his mouth and just excessive saliva going all down his, you know, face and neck and clothes. So it's hard because it's like, okay, do I let him keep chewing on his hands or do I give him the jewelry? You know? Well, I mean, you give him the jewelry, but I would investigate that a lot, a lot more um, than, I mean, I don't know how much you've investigated. Drooling is also another big issue that, you know, if he's drooling, that's, that needs to be investigated. Like that's not a part of autism. Chewing excessively is not part of autism. Like you need to get to the bottom of it. I'm going to do that. Thank you. (laughs) And you, and you can see, like you wanted to talk about self injurious behavior and tantrums, which we are going to get to (laughs) for those of you listening, we're getting there. But as you can see, if you don't do this quick snapshot, 10 minute assessment, which is now available on digital, we're missing all of these clues. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, his tantrums and self-injurious behavior is telling us, is communicating something to us, right? But unless we are the detective looking at all of these areas, um, we're, we're kind of, jumping to focus on the wrong things too quickly. Right. Um, okay. So we're not going to talk about echoics, intraverbals. How about his receptive language on the bottom of the column too? Uh, can he touch his body parts? Can he, um, no. can he follow directions? It doesn't touch his body parts, doesn't follow directions. Um, yeah. Okay. These are all things his younger brother does. Yeah. Maddox does not do these things. But- yeah. So, you know, instead of working so hard on expressive language, we also need to really build up that, that receptive language too. that understanding even body parts is so important. That's why I'm such a big fan of potato head, because even for older kids who don't yet talk, you know, they need to know their body parts to at least point to what, what's hurting or if there's a problem and that sort of thing, which is later down the line. I did want to get your thoughts though, on what I said, which is probably going to come out, you know, um, after we talk about self-injurious behavior, but you know, when I said, don't just bucket him into the severe category now at four, what, what's your reaction to that? So my reaction to that is, um, Yes, Maddox is right now currently extremely high needs, extremely. And I like to what they say, walk in faith and believe, which is why I do things like how I took your course and, you know, help to educate him every single day. But at the same time, 
I don't want to, um, I guess it could sound kind of morbid. <laughs> I have to prepare myself if I'm going to take care of him for the rest of my life, at least, and have him live with us. And cause it's hard, you know, on me and my husband and even our relationship, I'm not going to lie. It's extremely hard and things, you know, having to possibly move and do these things and see him with his self injurious behavior. That's hard as a parent. Um, that's why I don't stop helping him. No matter what with Maddox, I'm going to keep helping him. I'm going to keep researching. I'm going to keep trying new things um, to see how far he can go and is willing to go. Because with my son and a lot of people who are autistic, I believe he knows so much more than what I think that he knows. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing that through things like ABA. So I do feel like um, he's severe according to his diagnosis and communication, but I see he is gaining communication with his AAC device. And, you know, through some sign, like he can only do about two signs, but the fact that he did learn a new sign in the past couple of weeks shows he can learn these things. So mm -hmm. I, I believe in my son so much, probably more than anyone. And that's great because I'm his mother. So I do feel like he can make a lot of progress and he can, um, reduce a lot of his autistic signs and possibly maybe one day show no signs of autism but I still have to prepare myself if he doesn't and if he's going to be with me and if I'm going to be the one you know helping him go to the toilet when he's 30 years old say so I want to prepare myself but I do see a light you know and I'm reaching for it for my son because I can't stop reaching because I want the best for my son I'm sure as any mother would so those right. are my thoughts. <laughs> that's, that's great. Okay. Let's jump back in here to imitation. Can he do any imitation? Well, you said he's like following his, his brother. Yes. His brother's a great role model. Okay. Um, so he imitates things that his little brother does. His, um, like we got him a quad when he was 18 months old and at 18 months old, his younger brother started writing the quad and Maddox never tried, never wanted to. And now he's attempting to. So things like, um, you know, if you, you tap your hand on the table, do this, <laughs> you know, like they do in the autism diagnosis at times he will do that or um, pat his legs. If you pat your legs, he's starting to gain some imitation through super simple songs on YouTube, stuff like that. Um, so if you say clap your hands, you know, or sing the song, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, he'll clap his hands. Mm -hmm. But sometimes he doesn't get it and he might stomp his feet instead of clap his hands. So he still gets really confused with that. So his imitation is very minimal. Yeah. I would, you know, imitation usually um, comes before receptive language, like the pairing of clap your hands or touch your head with a model, you know, that'll come first. And so if I were his ABA provider, I'd be looking at really a lot of those things that you said, a lot of object imitation, a lot of gross motor imitation, a lot of imitating his brother, either during therapy, after therapy, you know, we want to build up that imitation because most kids learn, all kids learn most language and social skills and self-care skills through imitation. So imitation, it sounds like he has some emerging nice skills. So that's great. Um, and then what about matching? Oh yeah. He's great at matching. He's great at matching. Ex excellent at matching. And what are your thoughts on, because in ABA, we just talked about some of this, like because they keep doing um, inset puzzles and Mr. Potato Head over and over again, or flashcards over and over again. And Maddox looks so bored. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I brought this up to him trying to communicate, can we mix it up a bit, mm -hmm. but still bring it back every now and then. So that way, you know, we're expanding in other areas. Um, I don't yeah. know. But yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So we want to keep like language enriched things like potato head and, and for potato head, not just going, you know, arm, arm and having him put it in the right hole. Cause we want him to be like arm, let's touch our arm and, and model, you know, arm or hold up the nose and say, tell me, what do you want? Oh, you want nose. Let's touch our nose, nose. What do you want? Nose. So you can 
um, be giving him expanding on everything with those inset puzzles. You can also start, you know, a 12 piece zig jigsaw puzzle and take, you know, other things, matching, expand the field size, expand what he has to do um, and build in right away the, the receptive skills that go with matching. So if he can match duck, great, match duck or touch duck where you're holding up a picture of the matching duck and then he's touching. So matching and imitation skills, they emerge usually quicker in kids with autism. We want to use those skills to bring up that receptive and expressive language. So, and, and my thoughts of, it, it's great that your ABA providers like doing potato head and doing inset puzzles and that sort of thing, but you're right. We need to keep going and we need mixed verbal behavior. And it's great that Zulika took the course took all the courses, you know, paid for them, watched all the toddler course, some of the early learner course. She's back now for the, for the whole thing. Um, but Zulika's professional, the professionals in her life need to take the course too. They can get behavior analyst credits. They can get their early intervention credits. It's not fair to expect Zulika to be the mom and run the program when she's got ABA providers coming in five hours a day. And, and it, a great start would be to have them suggest they read the Turn Autism Around book, but it's probably not enough to just listen to this podcast. You know, it, things get tricky when you start to teach colors, you start to teach length of utterance, you start to teach prepositions and pronouns and reading and math and writing, and it's all in the bundle. And um, so ideally, if you were moving, you would want to find somebody that embraces my approach, which unfortunately, you know, it's hard to find at but least, but you there know, are a lot of people that do. Yeah. Yeah. What and do you feel about when, when you do have ABA coming into your home, like we do currently, should I, do you feel a parent should be there 100% of the time in the session or should parents break away? Cause I've been trying to break away a lot because Maddox, then he's having these meltdowns when I break away, but I'm trying to tell his um, ABA provider, this is why I need to pull apart. So he can be with you on his own and be comfortable with that and learn from someone else. The problem, yes, I don't, I mean, if I had to be around for 40 hours a week of Lucas's ABA therapy from the time he was three until he was in school, mm -hmm. I would have lost my mind. Um, you know, I would have gotten nothing else accomplished in my life. Right. So no, I don't think parents should be sitting there hundred percent, but I also know that the professionals I don't know about the professionals in your son's life, but I know that in general professionals um, can be like, yeah, we got it. Oh, it's normal for him to cry. No, it's not normal for him to cry. There are systematic desensitization programs where mom is in the room. Now mom goes to go to the bathroom. The child does not have a meltdown. The mom goes out to get him breakfast or a snack and comes back in and the kid doesn't melt down. And eventually the person is well paired and there is no problem with mom being in the house, not being right there. But no, I don't recommend you leave and let him cry it out. And, you know, and, and in fairness, the person that's there isn't a highly trained behavior analyst. It's, it's somebody that's trying their very, very best. And it's, it's a bigger issue than, than even we can discuss, you know, it's, there's so many issues. Okay. So that is the end of episode 201. I know we kind of cut the episode, maybe not at the best place, but the best place where I thought we should cut it. Um, the episode was really long, would have been our longest by far, and I decided to break it up into two chunks. And so next week, we're going to talk about her son Maddox's severe problem behaviors, and I'm going to give you some ideas 
give her some ideas and you listeners some ideas about how you can prevent and make the goal to get major problem behaviors out of near zero. So make sure that you tune in next week to hear part two with Zalika Williams, and that'll be episode 202. So I hope you enjoyed 201. Have a great one.